Chapter 7 of Atlantic Classics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. The Life of Adventure by Edgar J. Goodspeed. Adventures, said the gifted Mr. Disraeli, are to the adventurous. Stevenson somewhere recommends the conception of life as a series of adventures, each morning witnessing, as it were, a new embarkation upon some treasure quest or feat of arms. And I have often observed that my adventurous friends have a knack of reporting, with all the flavor of genuine adventures, experiences which upon sober reflection seem rather to fade into the light of common day. It would appear, therefore, that it is they who put the adventurous into life, rather than that life is responsible. In this fact lies much encouragement for one whose life seems set in a routine of commonplace, who lives upon a decent city street, where even burglars seldom penetrate, and nothing more exciting than automobile collisions ordinarily happens. These last are, however, of a gratifying frequency, if it is excitement that one craves. Indeed, we have laterally come to a weary sense of annoyance when the familiar crunch informs us that two motorists have simultaneously claimed the right-of-way, the pious duty of sweeping up all that was mortal of these unfortunates, sometimes becomes really distressing, and one feels like a modern Tobit, keeping watch or man's mortality. I make it a point never to witness these distressing occurrences. That would be a vocation in itself. Only when the fatal crash is heard do I emerge like Esculapius from his temple. I was a witness once, but only in a burglary. I had not, of course, seen the burglary, but I could still remember seeing the corpus delecti in situ, as it were, later than anyone else, and the proof that the object had existed had, of course, to precede the evidence that it had disappeared. Such is the logic of the law. Twenty several times I accordingly visited the halls of justice, and twenty several mornings I sacrificed upon the altar of duty. Months wore on. We witnesses, from our frequent meetings, came to be firm friends. We talked of forming a permanent organization. We even began to produce a literature, though all that I now remember of it is, for we're trying Johnny Artzel in the morning. I became so seasoned and habitué of the court building that belated witnesses for other tribunals, on reaching the witness room, would rush up to me and explain in broken English that they had been detained that they had come as fast as they could, and hoped I would excuse them, showing that there was nothing about me that looked out of place in the precincts of the criminal court. But with all this assiduity we did not convict our burglar. The kindly judge reduced his bail, that he might rejoin his family. He seized the opportunity to fill some golden teeth, which a prosperous dentist had destined for his fashionable clients, and this irate gentleman thrust in his case ahead of ours, though the statute of limitations had not yet run against us, and thus snatched from us the satisfaction of immuring our defendant in his deserved dungeon. This is why I never witness motor accidents, but it is plain that even this unhappy business may take on the glamour of romance when approached from the point of view of adventure. The other morning, when the familiar crunch informed us that we were again to function as first aids to broken humanity, I rushed into the street to see a large limousine of the eight-passenger type, now usual at obsequies, resting comfortably on its port side in the opposite parkway. What might it not contain in the way of youth, beauty, and interest? Yet in point of fact, when its cargo had been laboriously hoisted up through the main hatch, which was ordinarily its right-hand door, it proved to be nothing very romantic after all, and we gave it its coffee with a certain vague sense of disappointment. Some people really are not worthy of adventure, and it is a great pity that many who have adventures refuse to accept them gratefully in an adventurous spirit. War is, of course, the main avenue to adventure, and even so commonplace an affair as military drill has at least in its early stages, adventurous possibilities. 
our corporal, for I have to admit that I'm only a private as yet, being one day kept from duty by a seminar on Plato, an expert on the history of art, excluding that of war, was set over us. His eagerness exceeded his experience, and it is not too much to say that he led us into places of danger previously unsuspected. The company, though with the gravest misgivings, was called upon to deploy as skirmishers, guide left. Placing himself at our head and crying, Follow me, our gallant leader at once set off at a double quick in the wrong direction, where a lieutenant, much out of breath, overtook us, crying, Hey, corporal, you belong at the other end of the line. Follow me, ordered our leader unabashed, and we double quicked to the other end there to meet the other lieutenant, with the cry, Hey, corporal, you belong in the middle of the line. But one of our most inflexible deans occupied the middle with his squad, and his conception of military duty would not permit him to budge without orders. Perhaps he remembered the Marne and defeat by dislocation. With no place to go, our embarrassment was relieved by the captain's as you were, and we formed again in our familiar column of squads. But in the slight confusion, which I have to admit had for a moment prevailed, a uh, metathesis had taken place. From being third squad, we had become fourth, which position carried with it the responsibility of leading the second platoon. When, therefore, the horse order platoon's column left rang out, the company plodded placidly on in column of squads, we seemed to have lost our platoon consciousness. Our captain was annoyed. He knew that we had two platoons, but they declined to separate. Again the order came, without effect. The company now vaguely felt that something was wrong, and suppressed cries of, Hey, Corporal, you're a pivot man. Hey, second platoon, wake up, came to us from front and rear. With a start, our guilty squad awoke to its new responsibilities, and a sense of the eternal watchfulness of the soldier's life. Qui vive, qui va? The day before Marshal Joffre arrived, I asked our guide, a Plattsburgh veteran, whether the faculty company was to participate in his review of the battalion. His face darkened with apprehension. Say, said he, that would be a mess. He's reviewed better troops than we are. Never more desperate ones, though, we agreed. Like all great soldiers, our officers are modest, even about their handiwork. We of the ranks, however, in our eagerness, feel some disappointment that we cannot exhibit our newly won proficiency, even to General Barry. Well, I keep it all for Hindenburg. Battalion drill is a great day in the life of the military neophyte, and our favorite evolution is the company front double quick, it would have been a pleasure to perform this for the Marshal of France, but our last execution of the maneuver made our officers reluctant to exhibit our proficiency in it again to the jealous eye of authority. In company front, we spread in two ranks well across the field, and at the command double time, we inaugurated a really imposing movement before the reviewing officer. For some reason, the front rank of the first squad set a rapid pace which the whole rank nobly strove to imitate. The second rank, in fear of being distanced, came thundering up behind, and the first rank, hearing their onset close upon their heels, regularly ran away. In consequence, our alignment, usually so precise, suffered considerably, and it began to look like an interscholastic quarter-mile badly bunched at the finish. Reduced to the more professorial quick time, at the end of the race we soon recovered our breath, if not our composure, and it was remarked that in the rush it had been the faculty orators who led the field, both things being, after all, at bottom, a matter of wind. Before we were dismissed that morning, the reviewing officer commented favorably on our drill, accepting only the double-quick, and admonished us to try to keep from laughing. Yet is it not well known from the writings of Captain Bythe and others that the British Tommies, go into action laughing, joking, and singing music-hall ballads? The other day the Major's usual stirring lecture on the art of war was replaced by that threadbare faculty device, a written quiz. The first question, I believe I am disclosing no military secret in telling, was, name the textbook. The answer was, of course, IDR, 
but some poor fellows who had plunged into the contents without first mastering the cover were found wanting. The sociability characteristic of convocation processions naturally tends to pervade our military marching as well. At battalion the other day, we were trying to catch the captain's far-off orders and then to distinguish which of several whistles was the command of execution for our company, when a late arrival dropped into the vacant file beside me, and in the most sociable manner began to relate an experience on the rifle range the Saturday before. This extended narrative was much interrupted, for I lost him every little while under the stress of those far-off orders, of which he appeared quite unconscious. His method seemed to be to wait for the evolution to be completed and then rejoin me wherever I might be, and resume his parable, although he did occasionally complain that he had not heard the order. Nevertheless, we learned quickly. The other day, the first sergeant, a theologian of a wholly unsuspected bellicosity, called upon the squad leaders to report. The first corporal at once glibly cried out, All present or accounted for, whereupon each successive corporal, confident that none of his men had been killed or captured since the day before, joyfully answered with the same crisp and comprehensive formula. For all our attempts at militarism, a certain democratic informality still lingers among us. The captain is ordinarily affectionately addressed as Henry. Thus, while at rest, a voice is heard from the rear rank, Well, Henry, I don't understand what the rear rank is to do on the order, Company platoons right. Now the front rank, there's no such command, answers the captain patiently thus closing the incident. The captain frequently marches backward so that he can face us and enjoy the swift precision with which we carry out his orders. The other day he backed into the east bleacher and sat down abruptly on the bottom step. Luckily he gave the command to halt, or in our blind obedience we should probably have marched right over him, up the bleacher and off the back of it into space. I shall never forget our first review, it was with no little reluctance that our captain consented to our participation in it. He seemed to fear that we might shy at the visiting officer's decorations and run away. Only the most protracted good behavior on our part carried the day. After marching past the reviewing party, in as straight a company front as we could exhibit, we opened our ranks for inspection, and the visiting colonel prowled about among us. Just before he reached our company, a student major, in a frenzy of apprehension, came up and gave us one final adjuration not to wiggle. The colonel, a fine military figure, marched swiftly up and down our ranks, stopping now and then to address a few crisp questions to one or another of the men. He seemed to select those whose soldierly bearing suggested military promise, or at least our corporal and I thought so, as we were the man he spoke to in our part of the line. Or it may be that we were standing so like statues that he wanted to satisfy himself that those marble lips could speak. Our comrades were, of course, eager to know what he had said, and we had later to tell them that he had imparted to us important military information of a confidential character, to which they cynically replied, Yes, he did. We also tactfully let it be known that the colonel was anxious to learn whether our officers were perfectly satisfactory. With more tractable and appreciative inquirers, we entered into more detail. He had asked the corporal whether he had ever shot a rifle. Corporal blushingly admitted that he had once shot a squirrel. Corporal is a football hero and accustomed to meet the enemy at much closer quarters than rifle range. The rest of us, on the other hand, are publicists and are deadliest at distances of from 500 to 5,000 miles. Number two was asked if he could cook and claimed that he could. Colonel, in his haste, did not think to ask number two if anyone could eat what he cooked, or he would have learned that number two's cookery is best suited to prisoners of war. Colonel had no sooner departed on his inquisitorial way then the student major reappeared from nowhere in a fearful rage to inquire if we couldn't stand still even for two minutes, and to complain bitterly that during the inspection one man had been guilty of rubbing his nose. Murmurs of disapproval ran through the ranks at the mention of this wretched offender, 
who was probably responsible for dragging our company down to a tie with the law school for third place out of nine in the honors of the day. Captain now mercifully ordered rest, and a prodigious and concerted sigh rose from the ranks. Each man abandoned his poker-like pose of tension for an attitude of infinite dejection and fatigue. It was 6.15, and I remarked to number two that my back ached. He said his ached clear through. Our former corporal asked the captain what a man was to do if he had a dinner engagement. The captain said he had one, but guessed we'd all have to wait for orders to dismiss. Corporal replied that he hadn't one, but just wanted to know. If one is to rise in the service, one should never lose an opportunity of extracting military information from one's officers. We have not yet been promoted to uniforms, but last night after drill we were informed that, while we could not be provided with the invisible olive gray now in fashion, some antiquated khaki-colored uniforms of 1910 were being provided for our adornment. This arrangement met with no objection. The fact is, we are not wholly unaccustomed to wearing clothes of the fashion of 1910, and furthermore, while we have no desire to be conspicuous, some of us rather shrink from the idea of wearing invisible clothing, no matter how fashionable. So full of adventure is military life, even in its most elementary form. But after all, I am not primarily a soldier. I am a human coral insect, that is to say, a university professor, before whom life stretches, as Stevenson said of another class, long and straight and dusty to the grave. I should like to be a volcanic being, shouldering up whole islands at a heave, or even, if that could not be, perhaps engulfing one or two, reluctantly, of course, now and then. Whereas it is my lot in life to labor long and obscurely beneath the surface, to make the intellectual or historical structure of the universe soldier by some infinitesimal increment, about which, in itself, nobody except my wife and me particularly cares. Sometimes, however, I repine a little and wish that I were, say, a porpoise, splashing gaily along at the surface and making a noise in the world. Once in a while, when I'm going to sleep, for even a coral insect must sometimes sleep, dreams float through my mind of sudden achievement, such as might make one a porpoise or better. And once one of these nearly came true, judge how nearly. I was wandering through a half-subterranean Spanish chapel, fitly set with huge old missiles, dark altar-pieces, covered stalls, and quaint curios. Its dim recesses beckoned us on from one rich relic to another. Interest quickened. It seemed a place where anything might be awaiting only the expert eye of discovery. I had often fancied such a place, and finding in some dim corner of it a certain long-lost work of literature still remembered after a thousand years' absence. Somewhere in such a sleepy treasure-house it doubtless lay, enfolding within its mouldering folios not its quaint contents only, but fame and fortune for its finder. And look, yonder, under a corner staircase, is a shelf of old books, large and small. You approach it with feigned indifference. Here, if anywhere, will be your prize, a manuscript whose unique rarity will awaken two hemispheres, it is not among the ponderous tomes, of course, so you take them down first, postponing putting fortune to the decisive touch. But these small octavos have just the look of promise. They are thin, too, as it would be. And what period more likely for it than that sixteenth century to which they so obviously belong? Only the other day a friend of mine who lives on our reef, and on a branch even more recondite than mine, found among the uncatalogued antiques of an American museum the one long-lost Tel El Amarna tablet, which had disappeared almost as soon as it was discovered, and of which it was only known that it was probably in America. Thus may one be changed in a moment from polyp to porpoise, and be translated from the misty obscurity of the bottom to the stirring, dazzling, delightful surface of things. But after all, the plain truth is that adventure consists less in the experiences one actually has than in the indefatigable expectancy with which one awaits them. Indeed, I sometimes fear that people must be divided into those who have adventures and those who appreciate them. 
and between the two the affinity for adventure is greater treasure than the experiencing of it if we are possessed of the affinity adventure itself is at most just round the corner from us this opens the life of adventure to all who crave it what possibilities lie in merely crossing a street for example someone remarked the other day as he dodged across among the motor cars why not take a chance now and then and lead a real life for a few minutes i therefore recommend the life of adventure it conceives each day as a fresh enterprise full of delightful possibilities and promise and so preserves the wine of life from growing flat here is the secret of youth the moral of mr disraeli's epigram is be adventurous end of the life of adventure recording by wayne anderson chelsea quebec